uh, it's wonderful to have all of you out here to participate in this and to hear from the three fabulous candidates that we have joining us this evening. Uh, we're very excited. So just a quick uh, rundown and thanks uh, for some of the partners for this evening. University of St. Thomas, who's hosting us this evening. Uh, Union Park District Council, St. Anthony Park Community Council, St. Paul Neighborhood Network, and the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers. Whew. All right, uh, can we do a quick round of applause for all of them for having us all? So, we have three candidates participating this evening. Uh, there, uh, so just so you understand, all, we have all three of them here. Uh, we are going to try and do this uh, as much as possible, opening this up for you all to ask them questions. I'm going to say a couple of things that we really want to try and do this evening. One, tonight's forum is about housing and affordable housing. So while there's a long list of issues and things that we could talk about, we're really going to try and stay on those issues of housing, uh, affordable housing, affordable neighborhoods uh, in Ward 4. So that's one thing as you're thinking about questions you want to ask, we want to try and keep it on that topic. Also, one of the things I'm really passionate about is I want as much as possible for us to hopefully get the candidates to talk about well, what would you actually do uh, if you are the city council person uh, in this next term, right? So there's, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to throw politicians under the bus, but we all have heard politicians at times talk about uh, ideas and wonderful things and we are really hoping this evening to get to what would you do if you were there? And so I'm going to try as much as possible to push us to talk about that kind of stuff uh, wherever possible. So uh, there are some rules. Uh, I don't think that this would be a thing. Don't just start handing out campaign literature. That would be awkward uh, in the middle of this thing. Or put up signs in the middle. You would block people's view, for one thing. Uh, we have time limits that are strictly enforced. Uh, my friend Greta is right here with the timekeeping. Uh, we have uh, two minutes for opening statements. And then we'll have about 90 seconds for each candidate to respond to a question. Um, if uh, there warrants a follow-up, I might do a follow-up on some of the questions. And we'll try and do about 45 seconds for those. Um, oh, we picked, we really did pick names out of a hat in order to figure out, or we had them pick numbers out of a hat to figure out our order for this evening. So, uh, we have our candidates actually seated in the order that we're going to have our opening statements, and I'm going to do my best to give them each equal time with all these things. This is a lot of talking for me. So, with that, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to turn it over for our opening statement. First up, uh, she drew the number one out of the hat, so please uh, get us started with your opening statement, uh, Mitra Jalali Nelson. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for this important conversation. I would also thank all of our hosts that were thanked. Um, these uh, discussions really matter. My name is Mitra Jalali Nelson. I prefer to just go by Mitra. I'm really proud to represent Ward 4 now in the St. Paul City Council, and I have been serving my first year in office this year. Uh, I'm actually running for my first full term. I'm running two years in a row to do uh, the hardest, best, most important job of my life so far. Um, I ran in a special election last year in a moment where our city was growing and changing, where 20,000 new residents had moved to St. Paul, but we'd only created about 4,000 new places for people to live, uh, a community that had reached a tipping point and was 51% renter and had no renter voice on the current council. I'm proud to have made history last year and cracked that ceiling and become the only current renter voice on our council with one mission at heart, and that is to make room for everyone in our community, whether you've lived here for 25 years and owned your home and been proud to raise your kids and send them to SPPS, whether you just moved here and are looking to tell your community story by living here. Uh, whether you're a lifelong renter, someone who's trying to be a first-time home buyer, like so many young families moving to St. Paul right now, and everything in between. So uh, I've really worked to center housing in my first year. We've passed an affordable housing trust fund. We are on the uh, verge of passing a comprehensive tenant protections uh, ordinance later this year that I'm proud to be leading with community. We have uh, passed an updated plan for the Ford site with a uh, good necessary conversation about balancing density and affordability, which I think is thematic to a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight. And um, so much more that we've gotten to do in just one short year. I feel really proud of the work that we've done in just one short year. I'm running to keep leading change the next four years as our council member, and I'd love to earn your vote again. Thanks so much for having me here. Hey. Uh, 
Uh, good evening. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> How about now? There we go. All right. Uh, good evening. I'm Terrence Roberts and Bayless. First, thank you to the University of St. Thomas and to our partner organizations that helped to sponsor this, and most importantly, to all the residents that showed up here tonight. I'm truly honored and, and humbled to be here and really happy to be here tonight to talk about this. Um, at the young age of, of 21, I was struggling with addiction and facing homelessness, and I also was living out of my car until my car was repossessed and I was facing issues with the law and I knew that something had to change in my life or it was a very good possibility that I could die. And it was at that time that I enlisted in the military which truly saved my life. And from there, I went on to build the substance abuse prevention program for the Minnesota National Guard and then led an effort to lead the substance abuse and suicide prevention programs across a seven state region. After that, I just got back from my second deployment overseas. I'm an openly transgender man serving in the military. In this most recent deployment, I was responsible for strategic planning across 13 countries in the Middle East. And if you think local politics is tough, try, try serving underneath Trump in the Middle East when he tweets. It's not exactly an easy thing. But that's neither here nor there. Um, and now I work for Minnesota State Colleges and Universities as a project director for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, the issues that we talk about are extremely real to me, and I made it out of the system, not because the system worked, but because I got lucky. I went from all of that at a very young age to accomplishing all of this. And we talk about housing. Housing is the cornerstone of stability in people's lives. Housing is something that should make us all feel safe. Homes are, are something that should shelter us from metaphorical and real storms, and it's something that should be a basic human right. However, more often than not, that's not the case. And these issues aren't just talking points to me. I have lived through housing discrimination as somebody with a criminal past. So for me, again, this isn't just talking points. And you can't substitute personal experience. And I have an unmatched personal experience when it comes to solving housing and housing issues. Thank you very much. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. I have two confessions to make. Uh, first is I was not aware it was Tommy Tuesday when I picked out this purple shirt, uh, but <laughs> stroke of luck. Uh, secondly, housing is not on the top of my platform list. My three points are to fix trash, um, fix the roads, and create a safe policing environment. If I had a fourth point, this would be it. But as the former housing finance commissioner in Minnesota, Jim Solham, recently said, there is no grand solution to the supply of affordable housing, especially with people for low incomes in this city. And in my uh, ob observations and experiences, the more City Hall has done, the less affordable it has gotten. One of my points, fixing trash, is a prime example. We may or may not get into that. But I'd like to spend the second half of my introduction reading a statement out of an economic book by Milton Friedman. I assume most of you know who he is, a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, one of the greatest economic minds in the 20th century. From his book, Free to Choose, the classic inquiry between freedom and economics. And in specific regards to housing, he says, and I quote, the chief beneficiaries of public housing and urban renewal have not been poor people. They have been the owners of the properties purchased. Cited in the Wall Street Journal from this, the Federal Trade Commission looked into government's housing policies and discovered that they are driven by something more than altruism. The staff policy briefing finds that the main thrust seems to come from people who make money building houses. Contractors, bankers, labor unions, material suppliers, etc. After the housing is built, the government and these various constituents take less interest in it. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if we set a rule about props, but this is good. As a theater person, I appreciate uh, the commitment to it. It's good. I was told I could bring notes. Yeah, these, are all my, yeah. these are all my it's notes. Good. That's good. That's a lot of notes. Uh, it's only an hour and a half show. Uh, so, um, all right. I'm going to ask the first question just to try and get us started, but then I promise we're, we're mostly coming out to you all for the questions. But to try and sort of set the table for what we're talking about this evening. Uh, so... 
there, whether you want the government to use them or not is a fair question, but the government, uh, the city of St. Paul has tools that they could use uh, to affect um, affordable housing. Uh, and those include things like public land and tax increment financing, contracts, licensing. Uh, there's a wide variety of things that I'm not even listing. So again, Thinking about what we're trying to talk about tonight in terms of housing and what would you do if you were in the city council seat in this next term, can you talk to us for uh, this opening piece? What are some of the things that you would most want to do, you would first start acting on specifically as a candidate using some of those tools that the city has or choosing not to use them potentially? And I'm gonna start, um, Terrence, do you wanna start? Uh, one of the first things that I would like to do is to stop reinventing the wheel. So we do have a variety of tools that are at our disposal and we need to utilize the ones that work and focus in on how we are going to... In... Well, I'll try, okay, there we go. Stay in the tools that work. Uh, with regard to increment financing, I'm not too sure about this. But what we should be utilizing, when we overutilize tax increment financing as something throughout our city, and it gives millions of dollars to developers, stripping away our tax base, thereby decreasing our ability to contribute to things like our housing trust fund. So if we're going to give subsidies to developers, what I would like to do is have them contribute a portion of their profits to actually go toward affordable housing, not just inside the TIF district, but outside. And I think we need to move so far away from utilization of that so that developers continue to profit. The other thing is I want to see us start holding developers accountable because currently they hold all the cards. And we see market rate apartments going up left and right in this city and the right now is saying stop the madness. Instead, we just saw four market rate apartments go up along Marshall Avenue and not a single unit in any one of those apartments is affordable. They're being rented out by bed because they are so unaffordable. So if we're going to talk about affordable housing, that's great. But let's stop letting the developers come in here and do things to our community, which detriment not only the people that live here, but the people that also want to live here because we are making our communities less. And Let me ask a follow up on that. And we're going to get I don't know. It depends on how comfortable you are. You may be better off just shouting. Uh, so but uh, so you talk about holding uh, holding developers accountable if they're not doing. How how do we how, what what tools does the city have to do that or what would you actually use in order to hold that accountability? Sure. So a lot of times developers need variances to build their properties rather than just gifting them the variance to continue with their development. How about say okay if we're gonna you're gonna want that variance, well you're gonna need to give us something back in return. Not only that, but there's a something that people in Minneapolis use and also the Frogtown neighborhood uses, it's an equitable development scorecard. And that is something that we can utilize to get our communities to the table and to bring everybody's voices to be heard to say, okay, what is it that you're doing here with your project? How much is it going to cost? Well, how much green space do you have? What communities are you serving? So on and so forth. And then we can go about that and say either A, we don't support this, or B, we do support this, or we, or we want to see these changes happen. And we would have more teeth if our city would get behind something like that and the council would actually get behind something like that. All right, thank you very much for that. I'm going to go uh, Chris Holbrook. Uh, same question overall. Uh, again, thinking about these different tools that local government does have, would you use any of them? If so, which ones? How? First, I'd like to request some hand sanitizer if any if anyone has any, Terrence said he's got the flu and he's passing this microphone around. I don't like this situation. Um, as I, as I kind of laid out my philosophy in my introduction, I don't believe government subsidies to developers or other entities are the solution uh, to an affordable housing need. And the example I gave with the trash. Uh, I actually own a duplex. I have NOAA naturally affording... a naturally occurring affordable housing. That required me to add a second trash can, which costs an extra uh, $33 a month at this property. Guess whose rent went up? These people who, my rents are under the 30% AMI level. I do property ownership as a second job. It's not my primary source of income. I'm not, not a greedy landlord. 
I, I think there's too many rules, regulations, and tax increases coming out of City Hall. So I would work to eliminate some of those. I am totally against this 22% threatened tax hike if we don't say yes to the trash ordinance. So in addition to voting for me on November 5th, I hope you vote no on that trash ordinance so we can create a sensible solution, uh, which I've offered some, and so has Terrence. There's an, there was an article here, I'm, I'm getting the flag, by John Phelan, another economist, who said that there's wide agreement in the Twin Cities, there's an affordable housing problem, there's also wide agreement on the causes, excessive fees and regulations imposed by state and local legislators. Okay, uh, so, okay, I, I, there's a lot in there, but I, I'm gonna come to uh, Mitra here. So Mitra, same question. Uh, tools that you would use is, uh, or uh, foresee using in a, in a full term. Is this working? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's give it a shot. Um, the city has a few key tools that I've gotten to use in my first year in office to make a dent in this huge problem. The city has the power to do zoning, which basically regulates where you can build, what, how high, for who, um, and how tall. Um, if you look at historical maps of the city of St. Paul, the places that were historically redlined by the federal government to create exclusionary um, mortgage discrimination against African American and other predatory practices coincide with single family only zoning neighborhoods. So part of our wealth disparities are historical and come from our history of discrimination. We have to move to expand our zoning code, make less types of or make more types of housing less illegal in our city. So the zoning code is a powerful tool. The city needs to use its purchasing power to get in the game. If we don't buy the neighborhood somebody else is going to. And the city can convene as the HRA, the Housing and Redevelopment Authority, and it can use its power to buy public land for public benefit. It can support things like community land trusts that help keep wealth in the community and preserve low rent and low affordable housing. Um, we can use our subsidy powers. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund we passed is $10 million prioritized at the least served families right now by the market. That's 30% area median income and below. So we passed $10 million to work on strategies to get at the deepest level of affordability. And we have moved projects through the HRA this year that actually have put hundreds of new units that, of affordability uh, into our community. Um, it's just tough because we're not keeping up where we need to be. We have to do more. Um, lastly, we can regulate the market and make sure we have comprehensive tenant protections so that you're not screened out of housing you could otherwise get. My time is up, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot in there, and actually I wanna circle back on one thing uh, because a candidate Chris Holbrook, you, I mean, you talked uh, specifically about not wanting to use uh, certain things, but one thing that Mitra mentioned here is uh, changing zoning, which in some ways is actually getting government out of the way in some cases of like things we've set up. Is that somewhere where you might agree? Do you think that the city needs to de like rezone things and sort of leave that more up to the market? Is this up? Do you want to? Just be loud. Can I just be loud? You can just be loud. All right. Actually, yes, that's one thing I absolutely agree with Mitra on. And I agree with what the Minneapolis City Council did in eliminating single family zoning. That has a historical uh, factual proof of creating wealth zones and racial zones. I think that will naturally create more dense housing. What I don't think we need to do is spend a lot of tax in increment financing when there's already a state program. Uh, LIHTC, which contributes 10 to 12 million dollars to developers. It makes more sense to me if someone needs money to afford the rent to give the money to that person instead of taking it from all the taxpayers and giving it to developers. Uh, and so I'll give Mitra a chance as I follow up with everyone else. Can you maybe answer that piece? What's the argument for if the state is doing this in some way? Why does the city need to do it as well? the city need to be putting money behind this uh, in a similar way potentially. I think that the city needs to be in the game as much as the county and federal government. And I think it's important to name the history that got us here. In the 80s, Ronald Reagan literally said, we're getting the federal government out of housing. He pulled out of HUD, Section 8 vouchers, affordable units, all of these thousands of all over the country and at the same time, communities consistently said no over and over and over again to new housing of every single kind. And those two things, decades, massive shortages, massive, massive shortages. Um, a lot of housing that was marketed as being built would have been opposed and is now uh, trendy housing that's affordable and old today, and those costs come down. So it's hard because in housing, there's a short-term game and a long-term, and we have to fight on all fronts, and we need to put city money on the table 
as we see less and less investment, we also have to demand more from our partners at every level of government. All right, thank you so much uh, to all the candidates. So I got this note, uh, our, our state representative is here. Uh, so I, I, work, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize uh, Representative uh, Kali Hare. If I heard, am I saying that? Sorry, am I saying that right? Yeah, thank you. For now, that you would like to ask yourself uh, about housing, affordable housing, raise your hand and I will come towards you in a non threatening manner with the microphone. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try and sneak behind you here. Uh, this is good. Hello. 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 Handsome sweater. Oh, thank you. That might be uh, it's not on. Just okay. be loud. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Henry, Ward 4 resident, uh, also. Uh, leader of St. Paul chapter of Neighbors for More Neighbors, and I just wanted to ask about, heard some discussion about housing density. Um, will you support allowing quadplexes throughout all of the city so that we're not just um, limiting single, like a lot of our city just to single family housing? All right, quadplexes. Uh, I wish that we were playing bingo tonight because that would be on there. <laughs> so we're starting with Chris Holbrook. Uh, quadplexes. Would you allow them throughout the city? Yes. <laughs> wow. Uh, bonus point for brevity. Uh, Mitra Nelson. Is it yes or no? No, you can. You have 25 seconds. <laughs> um, I do support that. I think that this gets back to a point I just made about restrictive zoning code and how we have to maximize the land that we have to house the people that need places to live in our community. Um, Four plexes citywide is one of the kinds of steps we can take. It doesn't mean every single home becomes a fourplex. But right now, most homes can't be converted to something else, can't house more families, can't have four there instead of two, instead of one, unless we have them go through a process, a city approvals process that goes through a neighborhood planning committee and then comes to us. So um, I'd love to figure out where we can make some of those common sense uh, uh, changes in our zoning code to get more homes for everyone in our community. And uh, finally, uh, Terrence? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be unopposed to it, but I wouldn't want to blanket say yes across the board. And the reason behind that is because I would like to see our city develop a comprehensive plan. If you look at our 2040 plan right now, it actually isn't a plan. So there is a map that shows where future development is going to take place, and there's a bunch of circles on that map. Well, anybody can draw circles on a map. But if we're going to meet the demands of what we need for housing and what that needs to look like for our development, it needs to be a targeted approach through proper urban planning so that we can make sure that we're accounting for proper density. We can make sure that it's environmentally sound and environmentally friendly because we can't continue to tax our infrastructure in ways, particularly our wastewater and our sewer systems because we have a lot of runoff and if we just continue to blanket density you know, all over the place, we have the potential to completely ruin a lot of our green space and thereby increased costs, again, for homeowners because you'll have flooding increases, so on and so forth. So I'm not going to blanket say yes because we need a plan. I just want somebody to develop a plan. Can you say more about, like, what what specifically, how would that plan, uh, if you were there, look different than the one that we have now? I know that you mentioned the circles and then we have more urban planning. Like, can you give us, like, some examples to sort of grapple onto of, like, what you would have in that plan that's not there now? Sure. Well, it wouldn't just be circles on a map. Can tell you that much. What I would like to see is we need to get the right people to the table and I don't know how to solve any, every one of these problems and I'm not standing up here claiming that I know how to do that but what I am is a leader and I know how to get the right people to the table and we need to have our communities involved in development of our plan for our future along with the right types of key players from our city, from our state, from our county and in, in our community organizations to tackle this so it needs to have that proper development and proper input from everybody that's involved. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there was a hand over here somewhere, and I'll come over this way. Hello. Great. Uh, I'm Joshua Donato. I'm, uh, I live in uh, Ward 4 as well. Um, if you're elected, how do you plan to support single-family homeowners? Very good question. And for this one, we'll go back to starting uh, with... We're uh, back shouting. Um, so I learned a lot about issues hitting homeowners in our community in the first year in office. Um, there's been a huge conversation about how we finance our city through things like our right-of-way program and street assessments. Um, I bet people come to my office hours and say they're getting hit with three to seven to eleven thousand dollar bills, and we're currently figuring out how to retool that so that it's a fairer assessment that pays for basic things like our roads. 
Um, we have a lot of work to do on not balancing all of our property tax revenue on the backs of homeowners, and we have disproportionate challenges with that in St. Paul because we have so many churches, nonprofits, universities, places that do great work but don't pay to the tax base. And when we don't have a massive downtown with the same kind of um, major company presence the way that Minneapolis does, but we have roughly the same population, but about a third of their budget, that means that people are getting hit harder. So I think that actually having a big picture view that looks at smart development that's sustainable and forward thinking is a way to balance the load. It's not just residential, it's commercial development. It's our really great business corridors like a unique Little Africa corridor on Snelling, University, Selby, Marshall, all these are great business corridors and we need to figure out how to support them. It's using, there's a lot of industrial land in Ward 4 that is either going to become kind of the new industrial and have three times the tax return or will turn into more mixed use and still kind of recoup something because right now it's like parking lots. So we have to look at how to grow the tax base in addition to not overtaxing one group of residents. It's a very holistic approach in my mind. Those are some of the things that we need. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to go to Terrence next. Sure. So how would I support homeowners? Uh, my wife and I are young homeowners. It wasn't that long ago that we were renters. And now we are young homeowners with three generations living under one roof. And my mortgage has gone up $400 a month in three years. The only reason that housing and buying a home is accessible to me is because I have served overseas in two wars and I qualify for benefits as a service-connected disabled veteran. And that shouldn't have to be what makes somebody uh, have the opportunity to own a home. And we are significantly overburdening our homeowners with taxes. And our city is under lawsuit after lawsuit, again, eating at our tax base, which is being put right on the backs of homeowners. And we talked about right away assessments. Well, the city totally goofed that one up, resulting in another lawsuit last year, and they're under another one this year. So I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars are getting spent towards uh, fighting these lawsuits because the city keeps making piss poor plans. And again, we are the ones that are paying for it. But for our right away assessments, rather than saying, hey, we screwed up, they just totally burned the bridge. And instead of working with the nonprofits who did pay before it with payment in lieu of taxes, again, we burned that bridge. So now again, it gets saddled back onto the backs of homeowners. So we need to look at this and look at what it makes sense and what doesn't make sense and stop burdening our homeowners with year after year double digit tax increases and plans that continue to get goofed up by the city resulting in lawsuits. We have three lawsuits that the city's under this year. Three. What does that say about the way our city is functioning? Okay, I'm gonna go with Chris Holbrook here. Uh, yeah, so Terrence makes some great points and I would like to uh, actually challenge Mitra on a few things she said because she has voted for the 22% tax increase maximum this week. Last year, voted for the 10.5% property tax increase. The year before she wasn't on the council, we had a 24% property tax increase. There has been no challenging any of this from our city council representatives. Um, the fact that we're being sued repeatedly is the only reason these things eventually get addressed, whether it's right-of-way assessment, whether it's the trash contract. Um, I'm waiting for something to come out of the port site. Uh, I'd like to ask Mitra about that. She said she would only vote for high-density housing on the river. The plan she changed her mind and voted for is all mansions on the river, single family. Uh, which again, I don't have a problem with, but I think it's disingenuous to say you're for one thing and then act a different way. The Marshall Street zoning plan, it was a very similar thing developed by the neighborhood. There were, I believe, 100 amendments by Ms. Nelson against the neighborhood switches. So I think we got to put the neighborhoods first and take their input into account um, in, in all these cases. So there were several things in there that I want to give a uh, couple number of Mr. Nelson a chance to respond to. I'll, I'll just let you uh, take your picture. Okay. <laughs> um, the levy limit that we passed last week is 4.85% uh, accepting the mayor's budget proposal, which is what I'd like to see us get to. Um, there's an uh, additional percentage contingency in case the um, trash referendum goes through and we don't actually have a way to pay for our program. I need a contingency. I understand there's legal conversation about what happens with the outcome of that referendum. But in the one reading where we don't have a choice but to actually pay for it through reserves, that's what that's for. I think everyone on this council does not want to see that number go through. Um, 
So I guess I would just say the correction is that it's not an 80% increase. It's the max levy. Those are different things. Um, the 10.5% budget that I voted for last year, I would vote for all over again. That budget allowed us to get our affordable housing trust fund. It funded immigrant legal defense for the first time in the city of St. Paul, something that I campaigned very hard on as an immigration staffer formerly working for then Rep. Ellison under the Trump administration. It expanded hours for programming libraries and young people. I think we have to look at what's the value for what we're getting. Um, it's not just about the percentage increases. Uh, the foresight plan for me was a test of my values and ultimately I think good leaders find ways to make compromises. In a plan where there were 3,800 units out of 4,000 possible units, and we had to argue over mansions on the river. I did not love that argument, and I also felt like the totality of the plan was a massive step in the direction of what I unapologetically campaigned for the whole time I ran for office the first year. So I think those are times to step up to the plate, because in this job, you don't need to cast a vote for your perfect plan. You cast a vote for the thing that is going to be the best good for the most people. Uh, the Marshall Zoning Plan was something that I worked on very in my very first months in office. It was something that I inherited from my predecessor. And when there were parts of that plan that I looked at that came across my desk, it made apartment buildings illegal on the transit corridor. There were places where I asked planning staff what was behind some of the rezoning, and they called and said, the homeowner called and didn't want to be in the rezoning, so we took them out. There were aspects of it that I just could not, I could not accept. Um, we worked to compromise based on what I felt was appropriate and then what a lot of the neighborhood input was. It's not a plan everybody loved. I didn't. I know the neighborhood didn't. But I would either vote no if I had the chance to do it again, or I would still work to compromise the plan and not have a lot of certain kinds of housing when we're trying to be our growing in this community. Um, I have no apologies about any of that. Thank you very much. Both of you that, that full about two minutes uh, to answer that. So, Terrence, you were trying to wake me down. So, uh, did, did you have something you want to say? Sure. Um, with regard again to the 10% tax increase, I'm glad that you would vote for that again. But I would just ask why, because there are other creative ways than sheltering the, or shelving it again on the backs of homeowners. We other cities have creative approaches to fund their housing trust funds, whether that's like a hotel sales tax or a document filing fee tax or developer fees. There are ways to put money in your housing trust fund. Like I mentioned earlier, tax increment financing that goes for economic development, not housing development, but economic development, a portion of that getting set aside to go into a housing trust fund. Those are all ways to fund these types of funds without, again, putting the onus onto property taxes. So again, that increases rents for renters and increases costs for homeowners. I've seen, um, I've read a lot about success with document filing fees as being something that's easy to implement that can generate a lot of revenue in addition to how much, again, how much tax increment financing we use for economic development, setting aside a portion of that for our affordable housing trust fund. Um, Chris Holbrook, I'm guessing you are not in favor of any of these tax raising plans. Um, is, is that fair? I'm not in favor of raising property tax on single family homeowners anymore. They are bearing the brunt of every tax increase, every spending project in this city. And I will, I did say it was a maximum possible levy vote there. They, no one has even mentioned that we can get out of this contract, that we don't have to pay it out. So do your homework on this, folks. But I do support the pilot program, which I think Mitra brought up, which is payment in lieu of taxes, because 27% of the property in the city is exempt from paying any tax. They are all the stadiums, the universities, the clinics, all the government buildings. Um, and you know, just to point out, this university alone has $519 million in the bank. McAllister has almost $800 million in the bank. St. Kate's has about $100 million in their endowment. So I think the city brought this up a couple of years ago. It's called Pilot. You ask these people in your community to help pay for some of the services they're consuming, which they're not even asking for right now. So to push this again one more time, if, uh, and I, there's a conversation to be had about the potential of some of these nonprofit and government building uh, type things to contribute, let's say they do but not enough or they just don't, because I'm not, you, we could have a legal conversation about the legality of whether you could make them do it. 
then what? Uh, and I'm curious, like, if it's not raising taxes, are there parts of the things, you know, Mitra made a point about these paid for specific things. Are there things in that that you would get rid of then? So, <laughs> yeah, I'd get rid of people at City Hall, I guess. Um, you know, in well, who? ideal in fact. I mean, okay, who? Okay, hold on, hold yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, ideal in facts and numbers. And again, I haven't. I have a full time day job. I haven't studied this day in and day out for for my career. But in cities that have implemented it, San Francisco, there's, uh, I believe, Boston. They don't get all the money they assess to a. You know, okay, let's take McAllister College for example. They have 53 acres of prime real estate. If they paid the street assessment that I pay and that you pay, they would owe about 1.9 million to the city. They historically have collected anywhere between 25 and 40% of what they ask for, just as being a good conscientious member of the society. That would offset half of these double digit tax increases just by asking the question, what would I cut? You know, I, all these programs, you know, I'm gonna go back to the, the, uh, the founder of the Med Council, basically, Jim Solheim, well, who says there's no grand solution to this. So we need to stop reinventing new programs and focus on the ones we have. Every program, when the city had their uh, June ref, uh, resolution, the first thing in is, is we need to hire a staff and create a department to do this. That's why the trash thing has cost so much. Every action, they're adding staff, adding staff, adding staff. So that's, that's what I would take a look at. Okay, it, 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 was that a particular like staff and program that you're talking about cutting, or is it just sort of a general, that's something you would look at? Well, that's what I would look at. I'm okay. not in city council. Again, I, I would, this right here, by the way, is this, the code book for St. Paul. It is, if, if anyone wants to dare guess how many pages it is, it's 3,621. You didn't let us guess. <laughs> <laughs> so... I guarantee, if this is my full-time job, I would go through this with a tooth and nail and find out what we need, what we don't need. Now, it's broken up into the charter, housing, zoning, legislative, administrative. But at the same time, the onus of government, I think, is making it unaffordable on our housing. And we can correct that. Okay. This is actually, I have a question someone submitted on a card, which I feel like is a good sort of... Uh, I don't know, I, not mirror image, but a good sort of yin and yang of this last question that we got. So this question is, what policies would you propose to integrate affordable housing into neighborhoods that are primarily single family homes now? Can accessory dwelling units play a role in that? So uh, how would you integrate more affordable housing into neighborhoods that are primarily single family homes right now? If I'm remembering my order right, I think we're on Terrence to start with this one. Sure. Um, <clears throat> policies to integrate single family. Sorry, affordable housing, affordable more housing. affordable housing into neighborhoods that have been historically single family homes almost exclusively. Sure. Um, we can we can we can do a lot with regard to inclusionary zoning and mixed use development. I think that those are two policies and two tools that we could e easily u utilize to uh, integrate more affordable housing into our single family home neighborhoods. Okay, thank you for brevity. Uh, Chris Holbrook? Uh, just trying to keep, keep the brevity. Um, I think, again, instead of giving money to landlords, developers, realtors, if people need money, let's give the money to the people. I don't think rent control works. You know, if the rent for a two-bedroom apartment's a thousand bucks, instead of telling the developer, okay, we'll give you a discount to set the rent at 600 bucks, Give it to the person who can't afford to pay the rent. Just give them the $400. They can go wherever they want. And that's probably with a lot of these programs. There's so many stipulations for the property owner, the money never gets to the person who needs it. So to answer your question, I would propose giving that money to people like a voucher instead of crediting developers. So, I, and I'm just going back to the question here, but it's a... Uh, integrating more affordable housing into neighborhoods that are primarily single family homes. So is part of that answer then, that would be something that you think would happen as sort of a market force then? Exactly, exactly. Like I, I think the market sets the prices and if people need help meeting them in a supply and demand situation, let's help them pay for that without taking from someone and giving to a developer, hoping that they have 20% of their units be under the 60% AMI. Okay, I, and I'm going to give uh, Council Member Mitra Nelson a chance. 
Hello again. Huh? Try to be even louder. This is what I think is one of the central challenges if we're going to grow in a healthy way as a community. How can we integrate our neighborhoods and make sure that every kind of person can be in every kind of neighborhood? Um, one of the first votes that I got to take as a new council member was to vote to make ADUs permissible citywide. And that was a widely supported measure. It had the majority of district councils in support. Um, lots and lots of great personal testimonies about why that kind of housing matters. There's still some challenges to helping people make ADUs. The progress on creating them has been very slow. But we got the zoning piece handled. Secondly, zone, in terms of handling the zoning piece, uh, no, more kinds of affordable housing are still illegal in a lot of single family home neighborhoods because we haven't been able to do the rezoning that people have talked about getting to fourplex, triplex, or even duplex. So I don't want to be a broken record, but I will hit on this again. Um, I just think up zoning and more exclu uh, expansive forms of zoning are a starting point if we want to grow well as a community. Um, the other thing I would say is, there's a lot in my brain right now, so thank you for letting me use my notes. Um, we're studying inclusionary zoning as a city right now, and what that is is a type of zoning that would make it so that new development has to have a certain threshold of affordable units. Uh, there's a similar policy in Minneapolis. What I've seen in that uh, policy so far is developers walk up to the line and then they quit, and so it never triggers the policy. So as you start to put in those market interventions, you have to figure out how to make it work, right? It has to matter. So I want to follow that policy. I'd like to see it actually be real and good in St. Paul and thoughtful. That's another way we can capture some new units. Um, and I think I still have three seconds. So the rental rehab loan program keeps a lot of uh, gentle density homes in good shape, and we cannot lose those homes. So let's keep funding that. Thanks. OK, I, uh, I, somebody just said, like, oh, you're only reading questions. I only read one uh, note card question. So now I'm coming back to the audience here. So uh, all right, so uh, here you, you're standing. Here. Sorry. So right now, we have, a 10, we have a $10 million a year housing fund. However, in the last five years, we have spent over $100 million in TIF subsidies for the Saints ballpark, for the soccer stadium, $22 million alone for that, for an entertainment venue downtown. So I have a two-part question. One, are you willing to pledge that you will oppose subsidies that do not, for, for, for developments that do not yield taxes, which is the case with all of those, including three to five million a year for 50 years on the Midway site? And secondly, with the Ford plant, we're proposing a subsidy of a hundred and some million, and yes, we are getting affordable housing, but our goal is to house people in St. Paul. With all the market rate housing we're building, we have no idea where the people are coming, and it's just as likely that most of the Ford plant will be filled with people moving across the river. So how are we going to make that project actually yield benefits for St. Paul? Because with a hundred and some million dollar subsidy, we won't see a property tax increase or a property tax being yielded for over a decade. So we're talking about expanding the property tax base. I haven't heard any solutions, and this is one more that's about housing that's actually not going to broaden the base as we're talking about. Thank you. Yeah. OK, so there's a lot in there, uh, and, but, but they're good questions. So if I, I'm recapping right, first part is, uh, would you pledge to not do any sort of TIF deal or sort of city uh, financing for a project that is not going to contribute back to the tax base? And then the second piece is uh, a Ford site question, and specifically, how are we going to uh, make that happen in a way where we are actually growing and supporting the, the city's housing, housing, the housing issues specifically? So, Chris Holbrook, it is your turn uh, to take a bite of this big ear of corn. Does anyone want to guess my commitment to You're not going to let us finish guessing. Or <laughs> um. <laughs> so I do not think we should spend $107 million of TIF subsidy money and give it to developers to make anything on the Ford site. Uh, and by the way, Tom Goldstein up there, I want to thank him for all the work he's done for this city. He ran for this seat in city council in 2015. At that time, the race cost $10,000 for Tom, $14,000 for the winner, who was Russ Stark. This year, we've each raised six or 7,000. Uh, Matron Nelson has $140,000. In her campaign fund, with dozens of donations from developers, realtors, and bankers. So I just want to point out, follow the money if you want to know who's supporting what. Uh, I am not supporting TIF money in that situation. So that's my answer. OK, so that was uh, a good answer. And you, you raised something that I want to give Councilmember Nelson a chance to respond to. But I do want to 
answer to the second part of the question, which is, is there anything that, you know, if you were in the city council seat, you would do to make that uh, Ford site develop and uh, work out in a way where it was gro uh, answering this affordable housing question? The, the short answer is I don't know. I'm not in the city council. I'm not privy to the discussions, the plans, the analysis. That's not my neighborhood. I did go to a city council hearing about two years ago, and I'll post a video on my Facebook page, Chris Holbrook, 4W4, and uh, I basically dissented against the neighborhood's concerns being ignored, even though that's not my specific neighborhood. So I don't know. I would want to talk to the neighborhood, take their input in, and go from there. So I don't have a preset determination on what the solution is at the Ford site, except uh, not giving money to to developers. Okay, um, meet you, Nelson. I'll give you a chance. So, just to recap for everybody in the audience, there was a two-part question: Would you pledge to not do uh, city financing for projects that are not going to contribute back to the tax base? Second question: How can you, as a city council person, how can the city council make the Ford site uh, answer what we're talking about tonight, or be part of the answer around affordable housing? Um, yeah, I think that TIF is a financing tool that we need to use sparingly and for projects that are going to have huge returns. So I would generally pose uh, TIF deals that don't actually benefit. Part of the um, sort of blessing and curse of TIF is that um, people talk about it as a subsidy. What it is is um, a tax incentive that means that they don't pay back into the tax base for those projects, so it's a long-term impact over time. So what you have to look at with a deal is are you getting back a significant return? Um, PED does studies that show the economic impact of every single TIF deal that we've done. Um, we are seeing returns on some of the TIF deals that the city has done. And so I have always said we need thoughtful use of TIF and take each deal on a case-by-case -case basis because it does have impacts that lead to issues with our schools and how we fund our public schools and other things. Um, can you repeat the second part of the question? How would you make the Ford site So work? the Ford site, how is the Ford site, uh, what is the role that the city council can play in making the Ford site part of the answer to the affordable housing crisis that we have? Well, so for one, I said at the beginning of this that we have 20,000 new people in the city and have only created about 4,000 places for them to live. The Ford site is going to bring 3,800 homes to St. Paul. 3,800 homes to St. Paul. That is a massive injection of places for people to live. So I heard something in the question about how are we going to make it work for all these new people coming here and how does that benefit us? And I just really reject that us versus them, outsider, insider mentality. I think that our role as a city right now is to make room for everybody and make the mix work for people who have lived here and people who want to live here. Um, we had a plan that we passed that had a range of affordability, including 30% AMI in Highland, which is extraordinarily scarce. And part of why I felt like I could vote for the Ford plan overall is that at least one thing that we're getting out of those uh, big mansions that I didn't love along the river is that they hopefully help finance some of the deepest affordability on the site. And that's going to matter a lot. And that's going to diversify Highland. And it's going to be good for our community. Um, that's just some of the things. There's a long, long, long running process to continue shaping the Ford site. But um, I felt like we passed a milestone this year when I was able to vote for that plan on the council. Um, I guess I've been asked about some financings, but um, if so uh, I, I do feel like that was a, a very direct thing. And so, d yes, let's, I'll give you 30 seconds to just sort of respond to this piece about, uh, yeah, the, the financing and the, the contributions to your campaign. I guess I would start by saying I have been running for this seat longer than I think anyone has ever run for a Ward 4 seat in the history of Ward 4. I ran in February 2018. I had 10 days to build a campaign in a very unexpected special election. I got in and I ran in a gritty race where we built a huge coalition that includes numerous leaders of our community, long time and new residents, people who've never voted in a city election before, organized labor, and I'm the only person here tonight who can actually claim that coalition and say that we have built a movement that represents Ward 4. And when you look at how we worked this year to raise money, you will see that I have donations from individuals across Minneapolis and St. Paul. The majority of my PAC money, which has been characterized as some kind of evil Koch brothers scheme in federal politics, is actually from organized labor. I am the only candidate in this room endorsed by organized labor and working people. And I am not sorry for paying my team a living wage for funding expansion and turnout work, for being able to go back three times more to houses and apartment buildings that get passed over because the assumption is that those people don't vote, because we're not going to leave anyone out of this election. So I'm not sorry for being 
good at organizing and good at fundraising because that is the level of an operation our campaign is running. Okay. I just won't suffer any criticism about that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, that was my, my time gave you. So, Terrence, you've been very patient. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, do you, uh, just to go back to the question, uh, the original question, there's an initial question about TIF financing and whether you would uh, take a, a pledge to not support any TIF project that we're not going to contribute back into the tax base. And then there was a second question about the Ford site development and with that, how you would make sure that that is answering the affordable housing crisis that St. Paul has specifically. And there was some comment in the question about how do you make sure other people don't just come and take those and it doesn't answer the, the need that's already here in the city. In 90 seconds. <clears throat> We'll do our best. Uh, first, I just, I really, I want to explain TIF because I don't think it was really explained well. So tax increment financing, the way that that works is the developer purchases a piece of land and they get, they get a subsidy for it, okay? They freeze the property taxes in a district surrounding that development area for a period of 25 to 30 years. So then when they develop, naturally the property value goes up, right? So they're not going to pay increased taxes on that increased property value. That difference between what their property taxes are frozen at and what they would be now that their property is worth more, that is the subsidy that they get. That is the money that is filtered away from our schools, way away from our fire department, away from investment into our communities. That is the money that the developer gets back for 25 to 30 years. So that is how TIF works. And when we look at, uh, I, I don't support overuse of TIF, particularly, I mean, we look at the, how the stadium worked out and they're talking about creating jobs and so on and so forth. Yeah, we've created a nice pocket of gentrification right in the Hamlin Midway area. And we are seeing that right now play out as now the Walmart is closing. Well, I don't shop at Walmart and I vehemently oppose Walmart and what they stand for. There are a significant number of people that rely on that as their only source of someplace to shop that's affordable and or for a job. So, I mean, we are seeing that play out in the manner in which we are talking about gentrification happening. And we have to stop giving subsidies and tax breaks to huge developers. And not only that, but the way our city goes about this oftentimes is in a non-transparent manner. We can't show a return on our investment. That's why the Hamlin University is studying whether or not we're actually getting what we claim that we're gonna get from TIF subsidies. Because nowhere can we prove that 30 years down the road, we're actually getting that return on investment. That's why it's being studied right now and we don't have something to prove that we are. Okay, I'm, I'm letting my timekeeper down, uh, but, uh, but if I can, I, I'm gonna give you another 30 seconds because do, I do wanna get to the second part of this about the Ford site. Is there something you can or would do as a city council person to uh, work that plan, to work that uh, area in a way where it was answering the, the need that's here and uh, maybe avoiding some of the pitfalls the, the person who asked the question uh, outlined? So first I wanna say that Ford is the most prime piece of real estate in St. Paul. You can't tell me that a developer wouldn't have come in there and developed without giving them a multi-million dollar tax break year after year. I don't buy it. And not only that, but I don't, like, like he said, I'm not on the council right now. I don't have a plan on exactly what we're going to do to see who is going to be, be, you know, how we are going to be able to keep the housing for people within, I mean, that's, that's not realistic in my mind. People come to St. Paul because other parts of the city are becoming unaffordable. People often refer to St. Paul as Minneapolis's stepsister, you know, because everybody moves over here because it's more affordable, uh, but they work in Minneapolis, you know. Um, so, no, I, I don't know how to keep those homes available for residents of St. Paul, and, not, and I don't think that that's, that's feasible. Okay, uh, I've got this fun note uh, uh, from someone in the audience. Uh, so I think, Terrence, you're the only one without your phone out. Somebody is like worried that you're like, you have crib notes uh, on your phones, which I find sort of uh, funny that you would ha have thought uh, about all this ahead of time. But um, I don't know, uh, people have this concern. So you can, uh, we never said you couldn't have your phones, but um, it's up to you. Uh, all right, so I said that. Uh, okay, so. I'd like to, so this is another card question. I'm going back and forth, card questions, people questions. Uh, the cards are from people. I'd like to remind everyone uh, that renters pay t uh, property taxes too. So let's not act like single family homeowners are the only ones who bear the burden of increased property taxes. Uh, that being said, rents are increasing so much faster uh, than incomes. 
would you support a cap on annual rent increases, for example, a 5 or 10 percent annual rent cap? And I believe it is Council Member Mitra Nelson's chance to go first. I would support looking at a policy that helps curb rising costs of rent. Um, we have just so few tenant protections in the state of Minnesota. We are one of the states with the weakest laws protecting renters, which is why leading a city ordinance to protect renters, which is something I am getting to do later this year and I'm in the process of right now with community partners, is so, so important. We have to do more. Um, there are cities looking at forms of rent stabilization, so ways that you can basically limit the amount that it can increase over time. I think that's something that we have to look at. We are at a point that it is so, so, so desperate out there. The median rent right now for an apartment in the city of St. Paul is $1,050. Um, I rented all my life. Uh, it is just a different ballgame out there right now. It's just not the same planet as I was five or ten years ago renting. So. Um, I would support it. I think there's a lot of things we need to do in addition to looking at caps and uh, limiting the amount that it can increase in a short amount of time. Um, I'm happy to talk about that work more in depth. Um, short answer is yes. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Terrence Robertson, Bay Bayless, uh, same question. Would you support, would you look at a, a cap on rent increases? Yes, there have been there have been models that have been successful, and there have also been models that have contributed to the problems that some cities face as well. So I think that we need to look at that holistically and comprehensively, um, and we also need to look at ways to help people build wealth and generational wealth as well. So in addition to um, supporting rents on on on. Uh, rent caps, excuse me, voting limits on, on rent caps, I agree with increasing tenant protections um, and things such as uh, eliminating non-just cause evictions as well. And again, as somebody that has faced homelessness and housing discrimination myself, I mean, I know exactly what it is like being a renter and having predatory landlords take advantage of their rental populations. And that is something that I think as a city we need to do a much better job of as far as protecting our most vulnerable communities and our most marginalized communities because often they are scared to stand up for themselves or they don't have other options. So it's incumbent upon those of us that are in the positions serving our city to work with our community partners and coalitions to make sure that people have protections and they have opportunities to have safe, affordable, dignified homes to live in. Chris Holbrook, I have a feeling there's something about rent control in your Milton Friedman book, but I'll let you answer. So I, uh, whoever's worried about the phones, I, I actually print all my files and bring them with me. So I was just, that, well, that was a clock. Um, one quick side note on the last discussion, look at the Hillcrest situation. Almost a similar sized property on the north end, not requiring TIF money. I think the city paid $10 million for it. The uh, uh, Port Authority said they'll They'll develop it out, sell off the plats, and they'll make a nice profit. So, like Terrence said, Port Sight, there's, it's unreal that, that they can't make money on that instead of spending money on it. But I have an issue being a property owner, being a landlord, in violating the private property rights of those owners to construct a voluntary contract with someone who rents their property. Now, uh, a limit on rent, you know, rent controls does not work, especially when there is no limit on tax increases. And that's the problem with some of these programs, whether it's the 4D program, which is another new program, it limits how much you can increase your rent, but it never in limits the increases in taxes the city can charge you. That is a fool's bargain right there. Um, as someone who creates rent invoices, I think I know a little bit about what goes into that cost versus people who just pay rent invoices. Every voice is important, but I know, I've been doing this for 20 years, exactly where the costs come from, and they come from the city. And last quick note, I don't want to create a situation, a dialogue here of renters versus landlords. We're one community, we can work on all this together, and that's one of my fears, these programs where we, the renters have to educate the landlords is creating division in naturally good situations. Okay, thank you very much. I wanna go back to an audience question. So if you have an audience question, raise your hand and I will come towards you. Uh, I'm just trying to, I feel like I've taken a lot of questions from guys and I'm just trying to be fair. Okay, thank you. Uh, question. 
Hi, I, um, I live in Ward 4, actually uh, just a few blocks away from here. And I don't know if you're aware of this, in our neighborhood we deal with different housing issues, having students, St. Thomas students in our neighborhood. How would decreasing or changing, allowing, um, sorry, I'm searching for my words, um, eliminating single family zoning impact the student overlay district? That is our only tool that we have as a neighborhood, I feel like, to not lose the essence of our neighborhood. Sure, that's, um, it limits the amount of student housing within 150 feet of each property. Um, just because of um, the students, it just has taken over. And so it really was a, a good tool, and I'd hate for that to be eliminated. Okay, and so, yeah, thank you very much. So the question is, um, uh, increasing multi-unit uh, housing, how does that intersect with uh, this issue, this set of issues around uh, student housing and specifically this policy that's already on the books of uh, the housing overlay with students? And I believe uh, it is Terrence's turn to go first. Yes. Would you support the continuation of the student overlay district uh, as part 1B of that question? Do you want to expand on that first? <laughs> okay, well. Yeah. <laughs> sure, um, I, I meant the essence of the neighborhood having a good, nice balance of the neighborhood. So a nice balance of long-term residents and students that move every year in our neighborhood. Sure. I don't know uh, what the impact would be. That would probably be something that our current city and city members would be able to, you know, answer better of, of whether or not it would affect the current student overlay district, but I know that was something that was worked on, you know, between the university, between the residents, with students involved, and the community and the district councils, and so on and so forth. And I would also like to applaud St. Thomas for finally building some more student housing so they have second year housing. <laughs> um, but I, I would support the continuation of the student overlay district, and what I, what I would fear, you know, what I fear happening is is the absentee landlord situation because there's a loophole there where now parents are purchasing homes for students and then putting their names on the titles of the homes and you can see the effects of some of that with the degradation of the houses which again then goes to it will cost a heck of a lot more for us to try to keep that housing affordable because you're gonna have to dump a lot more money into it to maintain the naturally occurring affordable housing in that instance. Um, so I would support the continuation of that and I don't know the effect of a different uh, change, what that would have on the overlay district. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Chris Holbrook, uh, question to you. I don't have a great answer on this question because I just learned uh, what student, yeah, that's yours, don't, don't drink mine. Um, I just learned what this is, student overlay housing. I don't, ha I mean, I live about eight blocks from Hamlin University. We don't have that situation. Um, and I believe what the community and the neighborhood feels is appropriate needs to be respected. So I don't believe in, in absolutes or one size fits all in general throughout the city. I think we can accommodate zoning to allow more density. If there's a situation here that needs support, I would support that. I'd love to talk more and learn about that. It's hard to give a better answer in, in 45 seconds being brand new to this occurrence. Well, I, I, I'm fascinated. This is like, I, I'm, I, I, I will push you a little bit more on this. So the uh, student overlay district is government intervention in some ways. It's setting a policy by government to like say like how we're going to regulate where people can live. So is it one that you're open to in general to take your last question? Are you open to government regulation if it's something that neighborhoods want? Is it something this neighborhood wants? Then yeah, I'd be open to it. I, I'm not a dictator. I don't have all the answers for every situation. I don't think in general that the government should dictate private property rights now, if this school is bringing tens of thousands of people here who are flooding the neighborhood and there needs to be a solution uh, developed, then yeah, I'm open-minded to discussing that solution. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Council Member Nelson, I will come to you. Um, 
so I think the question was, if we have four plexes allowed, how does that interact with the student overlay district? So my understanding would be, if the student overlay district is still there, there's still the distance between the uh, properties, whichever they may be as registered student rentals, so there could be other rentals, but they would still have to satisfy that requirement. Um, since, um, Somebody, uh, so there's, uh, th there's, if I can take the general mumbling. Actually, we have an expert with us because our host for this evening is uh, in charge of, yes. So it would not apply to four plexes potentially, uh, triplexes and above. So that's part of, that's part of, I think, what's undergirding this question, if that's a word. Well, um, you know, as someone who generally advocates for more types of homes everywhere, I would have to say I'd want to figure out how to make it work. Um, I think that part of the need of, part of the, yeah, under the new reality where we have four plexes too. I'd like to figure out a way to do it all. I think that the dorms are actually going to absorb a lot. I think that's a huge, huge step, but we have to figure out how to help the neighborhood coexist. A lot of the things I hear about the student rental program um, from DSI is unsafe, overcrowding, um, things that are just students packed into housing and we want to make sure that students have a place to live on and off campus but also that that housing is safe, it's respectful to the neighborhood. So um, I don't support uh, discontinuing the student overlay district but I do support figuring out how we can meet the needs of our growing neighborhood in the coming years and looking at what that would take with community. Um, I haven't, uh, I don't think I've changed that position since I was here so I still have that position now. Okay, thank you very much. So I have another card question. Uh, this is a, this is a, is it, uh, Chris, is it your turn, or Terrence, is it, whose turn is it, Chris's turn to start, I believe, Chris, which is perfect, because you were bringing up before, you are a landlord, uh, mm -hmm. so this question is, what changes to the landlord-tenant statue, and they know it, 504B, uh, would you propose? I, I don't know what you're referring to. Five of, I could look it up in here. You could, so, <laughs> what, what, so generally, are, so, we have a statute around landlord tenants. Mm -hmm. You're a landlord. I mean, are yeah. there changes to that uh, sort of t uh, statute that you would like to see? I honestly, I, I don't have a proposal for that. I I don't know what a specific statutes you're talking about. Um, in my situation, the uh, again, uh, I have a full time career. So on weekends, I shovel snow, I cut grass, and stuff breaks, I fix it. I'm shocked how much it costs to fix things, get permits, and get licenses to get that done. I have a situation right now, and, and I don't, I'm a little laissez-faire, my wife gets mad, on collecting rent, and being firm with tenants, and enforcing rules. I have a tenant right now who has a car in the driveway, on a gravel driveway on the property, which has been there for several months, which was in an accident, he doesn't have the money to fix it, doesn't have the money to tow it, the city is finding just find me this week for this this car being on the property. I disagree with that because if he needs help to fix that car, some time, some money, I'm willing to work with him. But here again, the city is making me pass on $120 charge to him right now. So there's things like that. And I have, over the years, so many examples. You know, getting these fire occupancy certificates here, the city always has you pave a driveway, build a retaining wall, paint a garage, a lot of things which, which have nothing to do with fire safety, actually. So, uh, but, but I've been pretty fortunate in, in my tenants and again, my relationships, and I think both parties respecting each other is the way that happens. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we're gonna come back around to Council Member Mitra Jalali Nelson. Could you repeat the original question? So the original question, which I still have, is, a, is uh, what changes would you propose to the landlord-tenant statute, 504B? Uh, so what changes to the landlord-tenant statute would you propose, if are, any? Are you referring to state statute? I, I might be. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, well, there's a lot of things that uh, don't give us protection under the law right now that we need to look at in state code. I'm not a state legislator. We do have state legislator representation here, so I know she's taking notes. But um, right now, current law for tenants basically tells you um, what's going to happen to you, when, and by whom, and your rights are like getting notified of those things. <laughs> um, I would love to codify things like having advance notice, um, having advance notice and chance to buy your property, 
um, we need to codify uh, just cause eviction provisions, things that make it so that you can't just be put out for any reason. Um, right now, the number one cause of evictions in um, actually the country, but also in Minnesota, is actually just non-payment of rent. So even as we institute renter protections, it's still very legal right now to just evict somebody because they couldn't pay. Um, a lot of things that I've seen in my time supporting uh, constituents facing eviction is that there's um, a lot of times the um, scenario where an eviction order gets filed and then um, the person resolves it with their landlord, but that follows them around on their record. And so then they never actually were evicted, but they're carrying this like badge of stigma forever and it prevents them getting into housing. So we need to make sure that that gets addressed and that we have strong legal protections for renters in state code that support expungement, closing those records, and not letting them get on there in the first place. So those are some of the changes I'd like to see. Um, the local ordinance that we're working on deals with a cap on security deposits, so not shutting you out because you can't have money up front. It deals with uh, considering your uh, rental payment history in addition to credit score and some other things related to criminal background so people don't get shut out of housing. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, finally... I I am also not familiar with the state statute 504B, so I apologize for that. But I've I've spoken already and on my position on how much we need to strengthen our protection for our renters um, through I would assume the landlord the tenant statute. So in addition to kind of what Mitra hit on for the right of first refusal is something that we can utilize as well. So when, when, when landlords are looking at selling their property, they offer it up first to the people that live there so they have a chance to purchase it. And I would also like to see us move more toward cooperative type of housing so that people that traditionally don't have access to be able to have the money for equity or don't have great credit stores or scores are able to purchase uh, a place to live uh, cooperatively to provide more access to that as well. Um, and eliminating non-just cause evictions as somebody that, again, faced homelessness and was evicted, that is a badge that you wear around on you and it's extremely hard to then get housing and having a prior criminal history. I came home from Afghanistan, you know, a, a Bronze Star veteran, combat veteran, and I was denied housing because of something that was on my record 10 years prior. And so these are, these are, again, are issues that are extremely real to me, and we have a long way to go before we can eliminate some of the barriers that people face. But having lived it, again, I know exactly what people go through, and you can't substitute personal experience in this case. So uh, to try and just put a point on that, uh, Council Member Nelson noted a particular proposal around like not allowing an eviction to follow you. Is that something that you also would support? Yes. Okay. You can, you can get evicted far too easily. And you, when that happens, again, you can't get housing afterward, and then you wind up living in places that aren't safe, again, because we have a lot of landlords and places that aren't held to code, so the standards are poor, and you, you run out of options. And with people, especially people that are facing housing instability, we have to remove some of these barriers if we're gonna make it pe easier for people to access housing, and that's an easy thing in my mind to do. Chris Holbrook, same question, would you? Support that proposal? I support being able to evict people who do not pay their rent. Um, I've had to do that. I don't like doing that. But instead of telling people who own property they have to let someone stay in their property, because I still have to pay the mortgage, I still have to pay the bills. If I have no rent coming in from my tenant, why can't I replace that tenant? Now, as I said, I've been doing this for decades. I work with people all the time. There were a lot of lien years <laughs> 10, 15 years ago where some of my uh, apartments were, oh, two of them, I have two apartments. Uh, <laughs> I went six months without having anyone in them at, at one point. I worked a second job to pay my bills. Statue of limitations on eviction showing up on, on record, okay. <laughs> but to say a landlord, what Minneapolis did, I totally disagree with this. They cannot rule out people who don't pay their bills. They can't do background checks on, on criminal histories. Maybe that's something the city can make Ryan companies do on the port site instead of giving them 170. Okay, I have time for uh, one more audience question and then we're gonna let them uh, do a, a closing statement. So you've been very patient and been wanting to ask a question. Hello, uh, my name is Abu Naeem and uh, I wanna ask a question about uh, there's a strong relationship of affordability and uh, high crime in, in that area. So I wanted to ask, uh, how are you going to address uh, 
I would say uh, keeping place affordable and also safe as well, the community. Uh, yes, yeah, so the relationship between increasing affordable housing and public safety. And I believe uh, with this one, it is uh, Chris Holbrook's turn to start. Boy, that's a great question. Abu Naim, by the way, the Frogtown Crusader is running in uh, Ward 1. By the way, he's a city council candidate. Um, yeah, thank you. So it's interesting, when I go around and talk to people as I've been knocking on doors, I ask them what's important to them. And the first thing everyone says is safety. The city, obviously we all know we have a, a crime wave right now of, of homicide, of gun violence. So that's what people really want addressed. The second thing they bring up is this trash debacle. Um, now if I've talked to 100 people in the last two weeks, I have yet to have someone say, you need to address affordable housing. Is it important? Yeah, but it's not the number one thing. The number one thing is safety. Now, I don't know, I'd have to look at some studies, and this guy does amazing studies, the overlay between um, affordable housing and crime. I'm not ready to jump to that, but one of my fears of putting a segment of housing is you lock people into neighborhoods who are uh, the poorer people, and situations have been shown to develop where uh, in other cities, some of those apartments win awards when they're built, but like I said earlier, suddenly the apartment builder are gone, all the vested interests are gone, and the situation deteriorates. I'd rather see you get a housing voucher to go anywhere in the city instead of putting you all, you know, everyone who needs a voucher in, into one place. So actually, I'm gonna, I, I would really like all the candidates to address this because I think that there is something really important to dig into here. Do we accept that premise that uh, affordable, more affordable housing goes along with an increase in, in lack of public safety, that there's more crime that goes along with that? Uh, so I, I'm seeing no from uh, Council Member Nelson and no from Terrence, and I want each of you to sort of speak on this. Um, but so do you, could you just sort of flesh that out more, if, if you buy that or not? I mean, that, that's a deep question. It actually goes back to something she said earlier, where a lot of the housing was redlined in the cities to begin with, based on those situations. So there needs to be corrections to that and analysis to that. I haven't done all that. I can't, I, I can't say yes or no to that but I don't think it's fair to, to correlate the two without further studies, but I also don't think you can just ignore the case that the majority of crime happening in the city is on, on the east side, which is the poorest part of the city. So I think, you know, what's the solution to that? I don't know, we need to talk to people and figure that out. Again, that's not what I'm running on because I don't have the answer. That's a very complex question. Council Member Nelson, you uh, were ready to jump in on this. And again, I think it's a, there's both the question here, but I think generally getting at this premise, uh, uh, you very forcefully said, no, this affordability and lack of public safety do not go hand in hand. So can you flesh that out a bit? I reject the premise of the question that more affordable housing leads to more crime. I just categorically reject that. I'm gonna choose to believe you came at that with a good intention place, so I wanna make sure I, I say that. But um, I think that, uh, saying that low-income people coming into neighborhoods is gonna destroy the neighborhood is like one of the most racist ways that we have created unequal societies. We have blocked new housing in our wealthiest neighborhoods. We've blocked uh, anything that we don't like in the name of the character of the neighborhood. Um, there are racial undertones to that. Um, I think that's unacceptable. I will say, um, I know this is a housing forum, but in general, I have tried to advance a public safety worldview that assumes that people generally are good and need support, that police should be one of a whole range of tools that we use to take on very real safety issues in our communities. I am really working to create some space for this on the council. Um, we have a very limited lane right now in terms of how we've traditionally dealt with crime as a community, and I've really tried to shift that on the council in the ways that I've worked on that issue. I know this is a housing forum. Um, a lot of people tonight have talked about a whole lot of other issues, so if I chose one to talk about it, it would be that. Um, I hope I can answer the question given that the premise of it is something I really feel is important to rebuke. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Terrence, you also were, were shaking your head at sort of the premise of that, so I'll, I'll give you a chance to both to respond to the question and the general premise underneath it. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more that, um, that those two things don't go hand in hand, and I, I think that that 
too does have racial undertones, and that's something that historically that we have continued to hear from people as they look at how we are developing our communities as a scare tactic. Um, and we have areas of concentrated poverty in the city. They exist, and access to opportunity in those communities isn't equal. Our educational outcomes from those communities aren't equal, and our investment also in those communities isn't equal. But and we look at Minneapolis St. Paul's, or excuse me, St. Paul's 2040 plan, and we look, they identify where our areas of concentrated poverty are, and then they also identify where they want to invest. And guess where it's not? I'm not saying they'd have zero investment in the areas of concentrated poverty, but disproportionately it's in areas that aren't. And that's a that's a plan that our city signed off on. So I think we have a long way to go and we have to have holistic approaches. We need workforce development solutions. We need to not support the proposed fee for utilization of our rec centers, which again, we need to make more accessible for people. And that's a way that they're looking at generating revenue. And <laughs> instead of doing that, they're saying, well, if you utilize a free school lunch program, you'll be able to get access to the program still for free. So now you're telling me you're gonna put an additional burden on people by making them prove that they have to get a school lunch for free to utilize free services. Again, putting an additional burden on our communities that are the most vulnerable. So if we're gonna tackle these issues, we have to do them holistically. And I do not agree that increased affordable housing correlates whatsoever to increased crime. But I can sure say that by us not investing in our communities, we are doing a complete disservice to the communities that need the most work. All right. So uh, we have time for each candidate to make a closing statement. You get two minutes each. Um, and just uh, uh, since we started last time with Council Member Nelson, uh, I'm actually, Terrence, I know you just got done talking. Do you mind going again? Uh, can I, can I tell you? Uh, I'll throw it to Chris. Uh, all right. Oh, did you, you want me to give it to Chris? No, oh. I don't. Uh. <laughs> you know, you got to try, right? Um, again, I want to thank the University of St. Thomas and for all of the community partners. And most importantly, seeing so many people here, this is what really energizes me. This is an important conversation. And right now, our city needs a leader. And not only do we need a leader and leadership, but we need somebody that listens because more and more I'm going around in our communities and I keep hearing the same thing that no one is listening. And it's disingenuous when our city develops plans and then brings the community in when they're already five steps into the process and the decisions have already been made. And I have the experience of standing up and fighting for the people and the causes that I represent my entire life. And I don't plan on stopping now. Having done, like I said, strategic planning across countries in the Middle East, being an openly transgender man in our military today, I mean, I have faced adversity and overcome challenges my entire life, and these issues aren't talking points for me. You know, I didn't grow up in a wealthy family. So when I'm talking about these issues, I don't come at them from a perspective of this is what's good for me, because none of this is about me. This is about us. This is about the future of our communities, and none of this should be about me. And I want to center the conversations around our communities, and I want to put people back over politics and not the other way around. Thank you so much. Terrence Robertson Bayless. Next up, uh, closing statement from Chris Holbrook. Uh, yeah, I want to thank everyone for coming out. This is a way bigger crowd than I thought I'd see in the, in the downpour that was happening. Uh, and thanks, Mitra and Terrence. I know some of these discussions really bring a bring some challenges to the table, but I think we need to have those discussions instead of just, you know, rubber stamping agendas, which I don't have. I, I don't have a, uh, I don't have allegiance to a party or a company or anything. I'm just a resident. I just care about my city and I care about this ward. So I'm going to conclude with another quote from Milton Friedman. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks. It's, it's one's a little longer. I actually wrote it down. I hope I can get it in. He says, there are four ways you can spend money. You can spend your own money on yourself, okay? So when you do that, you really watch out what you're doing, what you're spending, and you get the most for your money. Second thing you can do is spend your money on someone else. For example, you buy a birthday present for someone. You might not be so concerned about the content of the present, but you're very concerned about the cost. 
The third option is spending someone else's money on myself. And if that's the case, I'm going to have a really good lunch. The fourth way money gets spent is spending somebody else's money on somebody else. And if I spend somebody else's money on somebody else, I'm not concerned about how much it is, and I'm not concerned about what I get, and that is government. End quote, and that's what I think a problem with our city government is. All right, thank you very much, Chris Holbrook. <laughs> and finally, uh, Mitra Jalali Nelson. Thank you again, everyone, for being a part of this conversation and for coming with your questions. I am really glad that we could actually take audience questions and not just, um, no offense to you, take questions for you all night. So um, I ran for city council in 2018 to be a new progressive voice for the future of our city. In the year that I've been serving in office, every single problem, challenge, and opportunity that I set my hat into the ring to run in the first place has only been confirmed by magnitudes I can't even begin to tell you. Um, serving in office this year has transformed my life. Um, I stepped into this work and I, and I stand in this work as a former classroom teacher, a middle and high school social studies teacher to um, students facing unthinkable things, students that slept under bridges, students that had been shot and then had emotional behavioral disturbances, students whose parents were homeless, um, things that made me realize I can't just stay in the classroom, uh, I need to fight for equity on every front in every way that I can. Um, I'm here as a community organizer who has worked hard within our city to do things like break down the processes that keep every voice out of these discussions, uh, to bring a voice to a new generation of residents making their way here, to unite that with voices of people who've lived here for a very long time and can look back at where we've been and where we're going with the long view and be able to combine those lessons with the aspirations of people who want to shape our future together. I feel like in the time that I have been here, we've accomplished a lot. I am running for my first full term to keep leading change with all of you for our community. I'm really proud to be your councilwoman. I'm really proud to have tried to open things up and change the way that we do things at the city. Um, I would love to keep representing us, and I hope to earn your vote on November 5th. Thank you so much for your time tonight, everybody. Mitra Jalali Nelson. Actually, can we just keep that round of applause going for all three of our candidates for being here this evening? Mitra Jalali Nelson, Terrence Robertson Bayless, and Chris Holbrook, thank you all so much for being here. I really want to say uh, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Uh, I know that it was very rainy outside. I know that there's probably sexier dates out there than a housing forum. Uh, but this is important, and this really is shaping the community that we all uh, will live in for years to come. So thank you for caring. Thank you for being out here tonight. And now there are cookies uh, in the lobby. So please go help yourself to those. Uh, I'll just say, as you all are getting up and leaving, thank you again to the University of St. Thomas for hosting us, the Union Park District Council, St. Anthony Park Community Council, St. Paul Neighborhood N Network, and the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers. Whew. All right, thank you all so much. Have a safe walk bus home. Mm -hmm.